Hours of Christ Fellowship with Dr. Stephen Gray. The message today is entitled, The Hope of Glory. So turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. You know, we've been studying this uh, in the Bible study on Wednesday nights. And we're in Romans 5. And I just want to say this disclaimer. Um, you know, the glory hit my life 1999 in Africa. And I, I got to tell you, I didn't figure any of this out. God just came on me and, and really dealt with me and showed me these things. Uh, sometimes I wonder why me, but I, it's not me. It's just whatever he's doing, I don't even understand it half the time. But I feel like Paul said, I'm in chains. I just have to do what his spirit tells me to do. And the second verse of Romans 5 says this, Though through whom also we have access by faith into His grace, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now when you hear that word, and some people even say, well, what exactly does that mean, the hope of glory? And the first thing I think of is when I came back from Africa and God began to take me through His Word and show me all about the glory. And one of the key verses is John 17, verse 21 and 22. And in verse 22, He says, And the glory you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one as we are one. So when I hear about the hope of glory, what I'm hearing is it's a hope of oneness. It's a hope of being totally reconciled to God, being intimate with Him in just the most profound way. You know, we remember the promise in Genesis 1, 26, when God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so Romans 8, 29 tells us He's, he's, he's making that happen. He's forming us into His nature and character. So I want to return, if you will, it's always good, especially since we're in January. Um, companies all the time uh, revisit their mission statement. And so I want to revisit our mission statement. This is what God gave me. And, and those of you watching on video, if you're not in a church that's walking in this verse, then you need to go look for somewhere else. I'm just telling you. Because this is what we need to be into. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 says, And these signs will follow those who believe. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say the most anointed, the leaders, the, the people. On, it says these signs will follow those who who believe. Key word there is believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Now when he says in my name, what that's saying is when God tells you to go and pray or God tells you to do something, that's when you do it. Not just willy-nilly because we know in Matthew 7, 22 says, many will say to me, Lord, do we not cast out demons? Do we not prophesy in your name? And he said, I don't know you. See, it must be done by the Spirit. So in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will be no mean, by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I've been walking in this verse for... 30 some odd years. I know it works. I know it's happening. We discovered it. We went to Africa and we've been in church all our life and we realized, whoa, God's still doing these same things today. And so, but you got to be on God's mission if you want to see those kinds of signs and wonders. You can't be in a meeting, you can't be attending a meeting and see this kind of stuff on a regular basis. If you want to see this in your life on a regular basis, you've got to join the mission of God. Hallelujah. 
So now that we've gone back and reestablished the mission, when we say, it says in this verse I just read to you in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, it says, rejoice in which we stand. Rejoice in, in the hope of the glory of God. Now, the glory of God, as theologians define it, is the revelation of God's nature and character. The Hebrew word is kavod, and that means weightiness. And so it's, it's like God's nature and character has all this heaviness because it's got so much in it. And, and sometimes you see this in services when the, the glory comes in just in such a heavy way. It is the revelation of God's nature and character. It's like God can reveal Himself to us in the earthly plane when He brings His glory. The Jews had a background about the glory. They witnessed the cloud when they came through the wilderness. They, they saw this. Uh, we go to Exodus chapter 40, verse 1, and we read this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, On the first day of the first month, you'll set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and you shall put the ark of the testimony in partition of the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange things that are to be set in order, and you'll bring the lamp scan and light the lamps. And you'll also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony. And you'll put a screen for the door of the tabernacle. And then you'll set on the altar burnt offerings. And he goes through this list of things. And then he says, and, and, you, and then the glory of God's going to inhabit this place. You see, God wants to reveal his glory to us. That's why he's doing this tabernacle. Hallelujah. I want to recall or call your attention to the prayer when Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter uh, 6, verse 13. The second part of that verse says this, the kingdom, the power, and the glory. That's what it says in that prayer. He's saying that's what we should be praying. Well, let me just explain to you, that is the plan of God, y'all. That's the kingdom, that's Passover, that's the power, that's Pentecost, and that's the glory, that's tabernacles. That's the three feasts of Israel, the main feast that every uh, male was to come to every year. And so we see God's plan is to reveal His glory to us. John 17, 22, I told you, Verse 21, he's praying that we be one with him. That's what God desires. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you. He wants that oneness. He wants the glory to be in you because that's the essence of what they're all enjoying together, being in unity. Jesus said when he displayed this oneness, the way he lived in it, in John 5, 19, he says, whatever I see the Father doing, that's what I'm doing. That's how you walk and carry the glory. You know, God can visit anybody at any time, but when you carry his glory, you do what the Father says. You go where the Father says go. Hallelujah. John chapter... 14 verse 10 says this do you not believe that i'm the father and the father's in me these words that i speak to you i don't speak on my own authority but the father who dwells in me does the work you see that's that's jesus operated in the glory because he only did what they were they were one he only did what the father told him that's where we got to get church that's where god's called us to that's why we're not seeing the glory and the signs and wonders of mark 16 17 in churches because we're not moving in that second corinthians 3 18 paul's talking about this glory we turn to that passage in second corinthians 3 18 and he says but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord beholding the glory of the Lord we're being transformed into the same image of what of the glory of God we're being transformed to that same image from glory to glory just as 
by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, the word transform there is, is a word that means um, it's metamorpho. It comes from the Greek word, which, which we get from our word metamorphosis. And it means that Paul is being constantly changed as he's writing this verse. It's a continuous, constant change. The more you access God's glory, the more God changes you, the more he reveals himself to you. And we know that's his original plan from Genesis chapter 1 when we read that verse earlier. So as, as I returned from Africa and God was showing me his glory, and I'm like, God, this is pretty awesome. You know, what do I do with this? And he said, you've got to enter in. And this is the verse that he took me to in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. This is, I believe, a command. And there's about six little things in here, six steps I want you to see. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, how do we rejoice in the glory? How do we, how do we have a hope of glory? You don't, you don't not going to ever have a hope of it if you don't know how to enter into it. So he says, verse 19, Hebrews 10, Therefore, brethren, having boldness, so you've got to be bold, which means you have access to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So we know, first of all, that because Jesus died on the cross, he died so we could enter the glory. That's also what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. It says the, glory, the gospel is just a door to the glory of God. Amen. So see, that, that's, what, that's what our purpose is, is to enter boldly. By the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, we're forgiven. Our sins don't prevent us from entering in. He goes on to say, which he consecrated. That means this has been, you've been set apart for this purpose, and this glory has been set apart for you. We've been, it's been consecrated for us. For through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, with truth or pure heart. That's speaking about your conscience. That means you have to have your mind renewed to enter the glory consistently. You've got to believe, you've got to know you're righteous, because that's the first thing the enemy tries to bring, is you're not worthy. Who are you? Who do you think you are? And so you've got to renew your mind about your identity. We talked about that last week. So you can access God's glory. And that your bodies would be washed with the pure water of the Word. There, you know, there are preachers today that are talking about the Word is not valid anymore. I, I don't even know where they come from with that junk. That's from the pit of hell. Old and New Testament is the most profound thing I've ever seen when you study the Word of God. I mean, just how it's put together, just the, the Hebrew, the Greek, it's amazing. Yeah, we got people that are saying it's got mistakes and errors. It does not have mistakes and errors. You're the mistake. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sorry, I got a little off track there. <laughs> and he goes on and he says, Draw near with a true heart and a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. See, there's, there's where our conscience is. Gotta, we got to realize if we, when we confess our sins, he cleanses our conscience. 1 John 1, 9. And our bodies is washed with pure water of the word. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Listen, if God's told me to enter boldly into the glory, then I'm supposed to be into it. I'm supposed to be entering in. He's promised us, go back to Romans 5 now. He's promised us access. It says... That's reconciliation, and that means oneness. You see how this all ties together. It's amazing when we see what God's planning. So when it, we read in, in this passage in Romans 5, 2, when we read about the hope of the glory, the glory of hope, we go, whoa, the hope of glory. This is the very plan of God. That's why we're hoping for it. It's because it's God's plan. 
Now, I want to show you another passage in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, to kind of bring you an understanding of what we're reading about here. Listen to this verse. It says, you, you could actually go up and start reading up in verse 24. I now, this is Colossians 1, verse 24. I now rejoice in the sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God, which was given to me for you to fill the word of God. The mystery, now this is the key word here, the mystery, Paul's talking about the mystery, the mystery which has been hidden from the ages. Let me tell you, you know what that mystery was? The Gentiles would be brought into this thing, just like the Jews. We'd be one people. The mystery uh, hidden from the ages, from all generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. To them, to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory. Here it is again. The riches of the glory, the mystery among the Gentiles. Because guess what? They get to get into. Which is Christ in you. Even the Gentiles. Yes, Paul. Even the Gentiles. The hope of glory. It's, it's just God's plan. When I came back from Africa, I was like, God, what is this glory? People didn't know what it was. And God said, look, the Bible is a story of my glory. The whole thing from Genesis to Revelation. The cross is just the door to get us in there. The gospel is just the door to get us into the glory. We've missed the main message, the main purpose. Hallelujah. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why it's the hope, because it's the real purpose of God. Amen. Those of you listening to this message, you've never, maybe you've not been in the glory, you don't know what I'm talking about, you better, you better make some moves in your life. That's all I'm saying. Seek God with all your heart. Hallelujah. This is the mysteries Paul's talking about in Colossians. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 10, verse 47, th th into chapter 11. He's talking about the Gentiles coming in is the mystery. Okay? Now, if you understand a little bit of church history, Paul gets his revelation, y'all. This is blowing his mind. Now, this is why I think God is just profoundly so wise. We ain't even in, we ain't even in, the, in the same solar system as God, Okay? And so Paul gets this revelation. He goes, man, all the, the Gentiles are getting in this. They're getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're getting filled with the glory. And so he goes back to Jerusalem to say, I need to make sure I'm, a, I'm on track here. Well, guess what? God's got Peter up in Caesarea preaching to Cornelius where all the Gentiles get filled with the Holy Spirit. As you see, so God set this up. So Paul's saying, you know, I don't know, guys, what are you thinking? And Peter says, well, I'm afraid he's right because I just saw the same thing happen. So see, this whole thing is, is God's desire. Listen, I want to read you. This is the commentary from the Jerusalem decree, which is what the statement they made when Paul went back to Jerusalem. Listen to what it says. Paul's, Paul could have had both ideas in mind so that Christ actually indwelt the Gentiles. In the light of the context, one of the last two options must be correct. Christ was also their hope of glory. <laughs> Colossians 1.27 The expression means that Christ was their hope of receiving and participating in the glory. I'm reading this commentary. This is an American Standard Commentary. It's a great commentary. And I want you to know, I'm just not throwing this stuff out of nowhere. This is, this is a confirmation. Because of what he did, his death and resurrections, the Gentiles could expect to share in the glory of God. Whoa! I mean, do you guys realize what we've been given? Here again, Paul stated that the only hope of glory is Christ. Gentiles like Jews must rely on Him for their salvation. 
Not just, I'm saved, I got my ticket, I'm waiting for the bus. I'm entering the glory on a regular basis. I'm living in the glory every day. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And let me tell you, the lost people, when you get walking in the glory, they'll start going, okay, can I talk to you for a minute, please? It's the reality of God. The Holy Spirit seals us with the day of redemption, it says. But I believe He also seals us with the glory. This hope of being formed into the very image of God. In other words, the Spirit's presence in our hearts guarantees ultimate salvation. God continues to work into us, continues to form us. That's why He brings identity into us. You know, and I think sometimes we think, boy, I'm really messed up. He's got to change me. No, he's trying to bring you into the throne room. He's trying to bring you into the glory of God. That's why discipling is so critical. You can't just wander into this. <coughs> Hallelujah. The forward-looking guarantee of perfection is what he meant by Christ in you. The hope of glory. J.B. Phillips' translation of Colossians 127 puts it this way. The secret is simply this. Christ in you, yes, Christ in you, bringing with Him the hope of all glorious things to come. His nature, His character. The hope of glory is the fulfillment of God's promise to restore us and all creation. Romans 8. 19 through 21 in 1 Peter 5 10. This hope is not a wishful thought, but the confident, expected, joyful knowledge that we are being changed by God and will one day see Christ face to face, having been conformed to his image. The hope of glory includes our resurrection, the power of the resurrection. I really believe, and I'll say it to you like this. When I got in the glory consistently, it, like, it was like I was coming home. I don't know if I can explain that if you've never experienced it. But it's home. It's home for you and me. I mean, I'm sitting there. I can be in any place of the world and the glory comes and I'm home. I don't know. Home is not a place on the earth. Home is with God and the glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we know we are being formed in the image of God. We got to understand who we are. Christ died for us. Jesus prayed when before he went to the cross that we would be one. Jesus prayed and gave us the glory the Father gave him. That's what he says. Sometimes when I'm in prayer, I'll say, I say, I need the Father's glory. You know, there's a verse in, I think it's 1 Peter, that talks about the Spirit of glory. That means that the Holy Spirit's job is to release the glory. So guess what? If you're born again, you got the Holy Spirit inside of you. So just ask God for His glory and sit still long enough to wait for it to come. He'll bring it into your life. It's all about desiring it's all about understanding. So when we were studying this in the in Wednesday nights and, and we read that verse and, and I had several people ask me, what exactly does that mean? And I started praying into it. God was like, are you sure you want to hear all this? I mean, it's so profound, y'all. It's really what we, we've really lost the message of the glory. I came back in 1999. I was traveling all over the world and people, I had pastors tell me, said, I don't know what this is, but I'd steal it from me if I could. And I said, it's just the glory of God. It's read your Bible. Romans 8, 29. Let me just read that to you because there's a ver word in here I want you to see. Romans 8, 29. It says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. I'm talking to you today about your destiny. You have been predestined to enter the glory of God. 
That's why he says, enter boldly. The Bible says the heavens declare his glory. It's all over everywhere. And let me just say this. If you're listening to these people that are out there trying to talk about the Word of God and this ain't right and that ain't right, leave. I'm just, I know I shouldn't say that, but I am. Leave. God created the most brilliant, intricate world. I mean, how it all fits together, just the cell. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And guess what? His greatest achievement was you. And so his work, you think, well, God did all this intricate stuff, but he, he really dropped the ball when he had the word made. No, he did not. It's profound. I came back in the glory. I couldn't even walk. They couldn't even touch me when I got back to America. And I, I had to go away. And I said, Lord, what is this? What has happened? And he said, get your Bible. And he started in Genesis, went all the way through to Revelation. It showed me. All through the Bible. The Old and the New Testament. Listen to what it says in Joel 28. Three verses. From where does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living. And concealed from the birds of the air. Destruction and death say we have heard a report about it with our ears. God understands its ways and He knows the place of wisdom. If you don't know God, you don't have any wisdom. If you're trying to figure all this out on your own, God help you. Exodus 20. Let me just read that to you. Verse 12. This is going to sound a little off track, but this is, this is how God gave this to me. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. And I thought to myself, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Honor your father and mother so your days will be long? Which the Lord is giving you. I thought to myself, how could that blessing, how could that affect my life? Listen, what you do affects your life. It affects your ministry. Revelation 2.1. Well, let me talk to you for a minute about maintaining the glory. I'm going to give you the, the bottom line priority, the key. As I close this message, the first letter of the seven letters in Revelation is about losing your first love. One thing you understand when the glory comes on your life is you become intimate. And intimacy with God is defined as an unlimited sharing of knowledge. It's not a sexual thing per se. It's an unlimited sharing of knowledge. You know, there's a verse in the Bible where Jesus says, he, He'll make everything known to you. The Father's made known to Him. And that's a lot of stuff. So there's nothing that God won't tell me. How much is out there that we haven't even asked or don't even know about because we haven't been spending time with Him in His glory? We have such an incredible relationship waiting for us if we'll take advantage of it. But we're so busy rushing to and fro and trying to figure stuff out and going where God didn't tell us to go and doing what God didn't tell us to do. But, but I, want you to, I want you to see this passage. I want to read this to you. Because this is how God said it to me. And it's just, to me, is very profound. Now this is the letter to the church at Ephesus. He said, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of seven golden lamps, says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you can't bear those who are evil. Praise God. Sounds like a good place to be. 
And you've tested those who say they are apostles and are not. Interesting. we still got that going on today. And have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Wow! This sounds like a great church. Listen to what he says though. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You've left your first love. Here's what God said. We can do everything right. We can, have the, we can do the best life. We can have the best church. But if you've lost your first love, you don't have anything. This to me prioritizes, this is where we've lost it, is the relational aspect of your relationship with God. Your first love. You should be on fire. You should be passionate about Him. I remember one, one of the years in Africa, I ended up in Lumbasa, which is near the, uh, the, in the Congo, it's near Zaire's border. And I got into this church, and I won't go through all the details, but it was not a good place. And, I, and, and God told me to leave. And I, I've been brought up with, a, with an African pastor, and he had three or four intercessors with him. And I remember saw, I saw him on the streets. I'm out walking on London Boss on a Saturday, and it was Independence Day. And, and they're celebrating their independence. And I, I felt like that's really weird. That it's like God wanted me to see all this. Man celebrates his independence. Well, I, to, I told the pastor, I said, look, I think, I think I'm supposed to leave here. I think God told me to leave. And, and he was, said, what? And he said, last night, three o'clock, I heard the lays all up interceding. They were praying in tongues, interceding. And he, I saw him at breakfast. I said, what was God doing? And she, they said, we think we're supposed to leave. And so when I told him that, he said, I said, okay, I'm going to pack my bags. And we were trying to get out of there. And the pastor showed up and we went through a big exchange and had some questions. And he finally begged me to stay. And finally, God told me to have mercy. So I go to this church and y'all, I've never seen the glory of God show up in a place like it did there. I saw tongues of fire. I saw it. I went to the back of the church at one point because I was like, am I seeing when I... And I couldn't even see the front of the church. The mist, the cloud was so thick. I saw the, it was coming in in waves. And they were, it was these white plastic chairs. And it would throw people out of their seats. And they, they were oh, groaning, crawling to get back up in their seats. And then it come again. Like, it's like, a, it's like a, an ocean wave. People weeping and wailing, the likes of which I've never heard that sound before. Just, just, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I thought to myself, God, why would you show up like that in the midst of a town celebrating their independence? And I felt like God was showing me that's, that's our problem, is we're, we were never meant to be independent of our God. We're supposed to be one with Him. And we've got to decide, stop thinking you're smarter than anybody else because we're all dumb compared to God. And get with Him and start listening to Him and be led by His Spirit and spend time in His glory. That is the hope of glory. So Father, this morning we pray and thank You for this word from Paul in Romans 5, verse 2. We thank you, God, for the hope of glory that you've given us. It is a hope, God. We, we all want to be reconciled. We all want to be changed. Hallelujah. We all want to be new. We have access, Lord. You died on the cross. You gave us access by faith and to Your grace. We now stand in that. And as a result, we rejoice in the hope that we now have the glory of God. We now have the tools and the passion and the access
to be changed into your image. You won't ever desire to be changed into God's image until you access His glory. That's what it does. It creates a hunger for your own death to self. And Lord, we repent this morning for not having that first love relationship. We repent, God, for not spending time with you and for desiring you. And Lord, by our repentance, we know we need to change. We need to change our minds, our attitudes, and our desires. We ask you to help us, Holy Spirit, in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, amen.